dun 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 insert the music here insert the music here all right good evening and welcome to Merryweather's world I am your host, Dr. Mark Merriweather Vorderbergen, author of Idiot's Guide Forging, creator of the Forging Texas website, and doer of many things. And this is my world. And because the world is so interesting, I just got to share it with you. Tonight, we have a super special guest, uh, Houston attorney, Mary Kahn. Uh, 37 years defense lawyer, uh, registered here in Houston, Texas, also able to handle cases in California and even in federal court. So, but before we start with her, uh, I want to just make a shout out to Wazoo Survival, uh, creators of the Forging Bandana. And for those of you who have never seen it before, the colors are actually much more vivid than it's showing up here. Uh, but because of the whole green screen thing I got going on, it kind of mutes the color. So uh, let me just uh, put them up there, Wazoo Survival. They are the ones that pay for the StreamYard account that I use to do this. And then, of course, for all of you new, let me just throw up the Fourteen Texas website and all that information, including my YouTube channel. And let me just put, uh, let me change this. I learned there's actually a difference between a lawyer and an attorney. So uh, Mary Kahn, whoops, it helps if I spell attorney, right? There we go. Let me just put her link up. All right, let's just jump right into this because I have a feeling we're going to be at this for a while tonight. So introducing the lovely Mary Kahn, attorney, Houston uh, person who you really want on your side. Yay! The crowd goes wild. They are. They trust me. They're going wild out there. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> All right. Um, like I said, tonight we're going to talk about what you need to know from a legal standpoint to defend yourself in the state of Texas. And uh, if we can spread it out, um, we'll, we'll, we'll throw in some federal laws and things like that. You got to keep in mind too. Um, I want to start with, uh, just, I'm going to put the ball in Mary's court and ask her just to give like a quick synopsis of your experience or something, uh, you know, basically to say, yep, yeah, this is me. And this is why I'm awesome, I guess. <laughs> Let's go there. And then we'll start in with the, the question we discussed earlier. Thank you, Mark. You know, um, I learned to shoot when I was about six years old. I was in Texas, of course, about the same time I learned to ride a bicycle. We shot cans off of a fence and uh, with a 22 rifle under much adult supervision, but we were trained carefully. And I, I grew up with a shotgun sitting by the front door. They said, don't touch the shotgun. We didn't touch the shotgun. It's real simple. You just kind of very, very, we knew that guns were dangerous and we don't touch the gun. We didn't do it. It's very simple. So I started off really early with guns, and I've sort of been a gun fan most of my life. I, I uh, represent people of, in all kinds of cases, from, from simple misdemeanor cases to capital murder, and I've done that for my whole career, frankly. So I know what really bad things people can do, and I know how much trouble can people can get into, even if even they're innocent, but they can be charged and charged in a mistaken sort of fashion. Yeah. So my mission is to create um, safety and freedom for the people who are charged frankly, guilty or not guilty. My job is to be sure that the constitution is upheld in all, in all things. So awesome. that's what I do. Awesome. That's great. Uh, so you have a lot of experience. You've seen, you know, what the other side will try to do to a person who's defended themselves. And so, yes, as you say, that's uh, you know, we got the constitution on our side. All right. Like I said, let's start out with probably the most important question. So, we're going to talk about a lot of advice, things people should do, which most of it will go in one ear and out the other. So if there is one thing a person should do, let's say they have forced, been forced to defend themselves. There is someone laying there, you know, from you know being hit by a car, gun, knife, whatever. What is the one thing a person who hasn't done anything else to prepare for being in a self-defense situation, what should they do? If you are in a situation and you have shot somebody or, or killed someone or injured somebody, first thing you do is call the police. 
So there's been there's there's been a, there's been a crime. I'm a victim of a crime. I need an ambulance, two ambulances. If, assuming there's one perpetrator, one injured person, and you, you need the ambulance for the for the victim for your for yourself, the victim, because you're maybe having a heart attack. You have heart palpitations. You're afraid of your health. You're you're extremely distraught, and of course the person that is injured now. Uh, I would. Okay. Hope and pray that nobody goes into a, a situation like that unprepared. Please, if I don't say anything else, do not ever handle a firearm unless you're trained, experienced, practiced, because there's nothing like having a gun and, and, and holding it and having some guy come up and take it away from you and shoot you with it. Mm. It happens all the time. Mm. There's also nothing like the thing in, and I think it was Missouri, with a woman and her husband, they're, they're standing at the gate of their home where people have broken through the gate of the neighborhood and they're standing there where she's brandishing a, a pistol unloaded as I understand. He's brandishing some rifle unloaded or un, 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 unavailable to shoot. They're arrested and charged with whatever they're charged with. In other words, if you have, if you were a trained gun holder or a gun person, you would know you always keep your gun at low ready. You're prepared to raise the gun, but you never raise a gun unless you're prepared to shoot and you certainly never touch the trigger unless you're prepared to kill. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay. I like the thing about the two ambulances where you, you immediately tell 911 that you need an ambulance for yourself because you feel like you're having a heart attack. That definitely buys you some time. And, uh, you know, just, just. And actually, yeah, but, but, but Mark, you really just say, I need two ambulances. There's two people here that need an ambulance. And don't give any more detail. Mm. But just, you need the police and you need two ambulances. Okay, that's right. You mentioned uh, earlier in our discussions, you know, the less you say, the less can be used against you, basically. Right. That's always the case. Yeah, until like you're in the room there, the lawyer that they've called is there too. Okay, so let's jump back to tomorrow, if that makes sense. What should the people actually be doing if, you know, let's say you have a, a concealed handgun license or a CHL here in Texas, or even like in Texas, whoop, did I lose you? Hello? Hello? We lost you again. Just a minute. Please come back. Where did you go? <laughs> All right. Well, what I was saying, um, yeah, I mean, if, if you have like a knife or whatever you're defending yourself with. Hello? Right, where did she go? <sighs> Come on. Come, oh, oh, oh. There we go. I, I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> yeah, I don't know either. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so we were saying, um, yeah, the, the ambulances say you need two ambulances. Oh, so now going back to uh, just what people should keep in mind starting tomorrow, uh, how they should prepare for someday needing to defend themselves. And Try out, I would, you know, obviously try out. It's like driving, picking a car, drive several cars, look at cars, look at prices, look at reputations, look at all that. Buy a gun and go and get trained. I've taken not as many firearms trainings as I would like to and go down to the range. Don't, don't be one that has a gun. You shot it 10 years ago and you're pretty sure you still know how it works. Be sure, be sure you know how it works. The more you practice, the more prepared you'll be and the more and the safer you will be. One of the things to keep in mind is you, you have a people have a, they say in 20 seconds somebody can move can be on you in 20 seconds. That's barely enough time to 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 pull a pistol or to raise a pistol and shoot. The other thing is, I hear this and I, I believe it to be true that somebody who's holding a gun pointed at you, you can actually pull your gun up and shoot them quicker than they can pull the trigger. Bigger. Because you're prepared to shoot and they're standing there thinking about shooting. Right. That makes sense. So you can defend yourself. So just somebody's got a gun on you does not mean you can't shoot them before they can get to you. Yep. But do Especially you if you're a Texan. <laughs> well, of course, we're trying more than some. But that gun yeah. thing, people can take your gun away and shoot you. That would be, it would be a sad thing. Okay. You mentioned practice. Definitely very, very, very important. 
Um, one thing that uh, my firearms instructor said is never keep a target. After you know, every class and stuff, we tear up the targets. He says, we don't want any proof about how good or bad you are at shooting because both can be used against you in the court. If you are an excellent shot, the prosecuting attorney say, well, why didn't you shoot the person in the hand? You know, why did you shoot to stop the threat? Or, you know, person, if you're a bad shot, well, hey, get more training. Uh, any thoughts on that? You know, I, I haven't, I actually hadn't heard that before, but you know, if you, if you shoot somebody in the hand, anytime you're in a situation where you're in fear for your life, and we've probably seen enough movies. The guy laying down on the ground, you think he's dead. Guess what? He pulls another pistol from his waistband and kills the, the his victim. Yeah. Yeah. You never stop shooting until that person is absolutely you're convinced is absolutely incapacitated completely. Shooting him in the hand, who cares? Yep. You got two hands usually. Yep. Okay. So let's let's then go into what are some justified situations. To defend yourself. Okay, so the the self defense is a defense to a charge. So once, if you're charged with a crime, or you're a suspect in a crime, self defense is a defense. So something has you you have to be charged or suspected of of shooting or killing or hurting or something, but and then you use the self defense. You can use your de de defense of self, and you can also use a defense of others. If there's other people present that you you come upon a scene. We recommend against uh, jumping into a scene you don't know anything about. Now, there was somebody on the ground, and he looks like he's really catching the worst of it. You don't pull out your gun and shoot the guy who's beating him up. You don't know but what the guy on the ground has actually been the first aggressor and almost killed the guy who's now beating him up. So we don't, if you don't know the facts, if you don't know the situation, but if you're at home and, and you have, or you're at your friend's house and you have a right to be there, you need to have a legal right to be there. Uh, then you can defend others. If somebody tries to attack or injure people there, you can, you can defend yourself and, and or others. Okay. That makes sense. Um, I know in Texas, if you find a trespasser on your property after dark, you're allowed to shoot first and ask questions later because my understanding, well, that again, this is going back to what my particular firearms instructor has, has told me. You know, multiple times. Um, is that any thoughts on that? <laughs> I mean, uh, my my thought and, and my my uh, experience, or my training says that you know we have a right actually in Texas that we can we can shoot and kill in defense of property, uh, especially after dark. There's very specific and very narrow uh, rules about it. What I what I believe, and I think I think for me at any rate, it's the best practice. If I'm in fear of my of loss of life, I will shoot to kill. And there's some point in shooting if you're not shooting to kill, frankly. But if somebody, my my daughter is here and I'm concerned for her loss of life, I can shoot to kill. If somebody's still in the neighbor's TV and maybe it's in the middle of the night and maybe you sit, you could probably shoot them. I I don't. It's easier to buy a new TV. Yeah. Actually, there's an interesting statement here. Uh, Regine says, if your land is marked, no trespassing is allowed, which suggests then if it's not marked. But I, I don't know anyone in suburbia that has their, you know, uh, no trespassing sign on their property. So I, I'm i going to guess you don't have to have your property marked, no trespassing or not. I don't think you do. And I think some premises are, you know, normally considered non trespassing But again, it, if you're going to take somebody's life, you want to be sure it's for a good reason. Mm -hmm. If they're cutting through the corner of your property to get to something else for a legitimate reason, or a couple of kids are goofing off and hunting gophers or something, I don't know. Yeah. Let's make it. Let's make this is serious. Killing somebody is a very serious thing. Even, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So you want to you know, make sure. Yeah. And that's my opinion. So. Yeah. Uh, so why don't we talk a little bit about the Castle Doctrine, especially there was a bill that's been in the news lately here in Texas that one of the legislators is trying to remove the Castle Doctrine and say you are required to try and make an escape instead. Um, Castle Doctrine, what would be an example 
Uh, I mean, it, I, I know in the Texas, the automobiles or vehicles are considered an extension of your home. And so you don't even need to have a, like a handgun license to have a firearm in there. That's so, correct. So, yeah. So yeah. you only need the CHL if you're carrying concealed outside your house or car. That's correct. You know, I think it was prior to 1970 or 71, something like that. We had a duty in Texas to retreat. Many states still have that. And one of the big things you want to do if you're traveling with firearms, there are all kinds of websites you can find about traveling with firearms, by the way. But it, it used to be we had a duty to retreat. We don't have that anymore. This is what they're trying to get away with. So we have to we have to retreat again. The, the you know, better practice is always if you can get away from somebody, that beats the heck out of shooting them and killing them. I mean, yep. just a practical matter, right? Yep. And frankly, if if I can just sidetrack here for a minute, um, you know, if somebody looks like they're coming after you to shoot, if you can run away and just keep moving, in other words, a still target is easier for them to hit. So you want to keep moving and you want to yeah. run away, yeah. then they're less likely to hit you. And most people are frankly, most of the bad guys are not trained uh, to, to be great shots. They haven't practiced. They have a gun. They bought a gun for 200 bucks off the street. They, it has bullets. Great. They want to go shoot somebody. Dodge and duck and get the heck out. And if you have to do it, then turn around and shoot. But we, we do have a castle doctrine. It's strong. And I hope to God they, they leave it alone because I think it's a very useful thing. And where are you going to retreat to in your house? Most of us don't have a safe room with bulletproof walls mm -hmm. and door and all that. Most of us yeah. don't have. That's why the drywall you know, bullets can go right through that. <laughs> so there's there's no cover in most people's house. There's only concealment. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I've seen some questions about non-lethal forms of self-defense, like wasp spray and tasers and, and, you know, even mace and things like that. Um Thoughts on those, if you feel opposed to defending yourself with a traditionally lethal method, switching to some other that some people believe are non-lethal. I think, I don't think, I'm unaware of any uh, restraints or constrictions on, on that, on using non-lethal force to stop an attack. In other words, you're you're able to use whatever you need to to stop an attack. The rule that I learned in law school, 1934, was you can only um, uh, address force with equal force, but not with greater force. If somebody comes and hits you with their fist, you're not entitled to shoot them, unless you happen to believe that you that this person is going to kill you with their fist. If you believe reasonably. And there's this what we call the reasonable man standard. If a reasonable person would believe that you're in danger of your life when somebody's hitting you with their fist, then you can shoot them or use wall spray or whatever you want to do. Yeah. But, but it has, you can't match a, 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 a force with a greater force. Yeah. So, and, and that runs into problems because there's a thing I've, I've heard mentioned quite often, a disparity of force. If you are one person facing two people, even though they have fists, you are now in danger of your life because they can beat you up. So it's uh, convincing the jury, it seems, that you truly had a reasonable man's assumption that your life was in danger. And it's, it's very subjective. Yeah. I mean, are these two, you know, 12-year-olds and you're a, you know, 200-pound, six-foot guy, they're, they're probably not going to hurt you that bad. Yeah. On the other hand, you know, if they're, young, you know, 20 year old, six pivot guys with, with bats, yeah. uh, certainly a bat is a deadly weapon. A car is a deadly weapon. Uh, an ice pick is a, is a kind of a popular murder weapon, actually. Yeah. A hammer. I think they said the hammer is one of the most used murder weapons in the, the United States. So. Right. Um, you mentioned car that leads to uh, another thing that's become pretty common in the news lately is protesters surrounding and attacking a vehicle. At what point, and I guess it, it kind of depends on the person when they feel their life is in danger. So you know, breaking a window, that's one thing, but then reaching through the window and trying to grab it, at that point you're in danger. Um, 
it's it's again it's very subjective yeah. and what you've got to do is you've got to be the guy that is number one keeps your mouth shut no matter what talking to the police you do not ever talk to the police ever without counsel and that's just a rule and that's the number one rule that i have that whenever i talk to anybody just keep your mouth shut oh uh, if somebody's coming into your car and you're in fear for your life then you can use force to stop them I would recommend, of course, using less than deadly force to stop them. Hit them back. Hit them with your crowbar. Hit them with your, what, your purse. <laughs> <With something. laughs> I say hit them with your front fender, you know, just. But, but, you but yeah, but again, a car is a deadly force. If you hit somebody with your car, I mean, I, I don't want to be in that position, frankly, yeah. ever, of course, and probably nobody does. But it is very subjective. So you have to be able to show that you or anybody in your position would have been in fear of of um, of, um, of, of of loss of life. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a loss of life. It's not just being hurt a little bit. You know, they're, I was afraid they're going to beat me up and hurt me. Well, okay. Mm -hmm. That leads to the thing. Uh, let's say you're in the process of defending yourself. And so they meet, you know, they started it. You meet force with force. They respond with greater force to stop the threat. Um, have you seen a situation where that, where the, well, I know, again, with the concealed handgun uh, license, they say, don't pick fights. Right. You know, if someone's mouthing off to you, walk away. You know, right. you, you don't. Uh, and you certainly don't want to be the person pursuing someone, you know, calling them names or whatever. So uh, thoughts on that, you know, like, uh, again, I assume just get out of out of the trouble, you know, some other way if possible. Avoid, avoid conflict. Just avoid it. And if you're carrying a weapon, again, be sure that they can't take it away from you and use it against you. And just avoid if you can get out of there, walk away, run away, leave in your car, get the heck away. Uh, you know, people say, oh, I got this gun. I'm going to kill that guy because he, he insulted my wife. OK, well, that's probably a real bad move. Mm -hmm. All right. Here's a, a, a common question. Uh, had a policeman tell me never to fire a warning shot. Is that correct? Absolutely. If you're going to, anytime you pick up your gun and you get it above your waist in a ready position, a, a normal ready position, not a low ready position, that's what the instructors will teach you. If you don't know, you're ready to shoot. When you put your finger on the trigger, you're ready to kill. That's the only time you ever put your finger on the trigger, you're going to kill something. Yeah. No warning shots. And that leads to one thing. I mean, are you thinking shooting up in the air or something like that? Because you are responsible for every bullet. Mm -hmm. um, I had uh, one person say, basically assume it's $10,000 in legal fees per bullet fired, regardless <laughs> of what happened, which is why I joined the Armed, Defense, uh, Armed Citizens Defense Network to, to help if that ever uh, happens. Okay, we got some, uh, let's see. Okay, this is it, especially in Texas. I don't have a handgun license and walk miles some days. I uh, was told by a police officer that I could carry a rifle and would have police protection all along my walk as the folks seeing me out their window will think I'm a crazy lady up to no good and will call them to check me out. I haven't as I'm unsure if I can legally walk down a public road with a rifle for sure. I wasn't sure if the law was different for concealed handguns versus rifles. It's a great question, and I don't know the answer off the top of my head, and I know that you can walk with it. Do you know the answer, Mark? Uh, so I do know in the state of Texas, you are allowed to carry a long gun, mm -hmm. um, you know, a rifle or a shotgun. Um, you, If you are walking around in a threatening display of it, mm -hmm. problems will start. But if you have it slung over your back, uh, or as you said, at a low ready, uh, the police will probably be called and talk to you, but there is nothing that can do. And especially in your case, Rebecca, uh, you know, if you explain why you're carrying it, because you have to walk these roads for whatever reason. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's something that has caused some friction in Texas is people, you know, protesting while carrying long guns and it's in their legal right. Mm -hmm. It's scary to some people, but. Welcome to the Constitution. So, right. 
Right. No, and I agree. That's absolutely right. Can I, can I say something else about the Constitution? Yep. You just reminded me. You know, we talk about the Second Amendment, and there's a there's a somebody sent me just the other day uh, a, a video of a movie that was made. I think made for TV movie called The Athens War. And apparently, in 1946, 47, there were there was a very corrupt government in uh, Athens, Tennessee, as I recall. Yeah. And I, actually, I I went to Wikipedia, the source of uh, all all knowledge, and read about the Athens War, and it was a, a very fascinating situation. But it sort of makes the point of why we have a Second Amendment. The other thing is we have a, a constitutional uh, hero of mine, uh, actually a lawyer in California, is a great constitutional lawyer, and he wrote a great Facebook uh, post one time about our constitutional right to own and, and bear arms. He said, we are not we are not subjects, we are citizens. We have a right to own private property. Mm-hmm. If we have a right to own private property, we have a right to defend that private property, which is our, our non-Second Amendment. Second Amendment's important because of a, it's our right to protect ourselves from a government, an overreaching or a corrupt government. Mm-hmm. But the, our, just our constitutional right as as being citizens of this country, we're able to, to own guns and to protect property in ourselves. Yep, most definitely. All right, here's here's another really good question from Constance. Uh, no concealed carry license yet in X state. She is not in Texas. I know this. Um, her question is, can I have a constitutional carry if I was in grave danger? Ooh. <laughs> um well, grave danger would have to be fear of loss of life to start with, probably anywhere. And frankly, in some states, there is no there is no right to carry at all under any circumstances. I was New Jersey. in a county of about 60,000 people in California. I lived there for a little bit. I was number 27 concealed carry permit, number 27 in, the, in a county of 50, 60,000 people. Wow. They didn't, uh, and of course, Texas is a will issue state. In, in Texas, you you apply, you get your you can still carry unless you have some prohibitions like you're a felon or you have mental, mental illness. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see if there's any other good questions. Okay. Um, I had some more. I'm just thinking here. We the. Uh, what would be your ideal case to 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 defend in? Um, like if a person did something, where would you go in feeling very, very confident, uh, regardless of the judge and the jury, that yeah, I, I can get this person off? And of course, you're you know a great lawyer, so you probably feel that all the time. But That's what right. would you want the person to have done? Let's say you know, like I said, before, during, after. Um, it ha- it's, it's a great question. You know, you don't get to use deadly force if you start the fight. In other words, you can't assault somebody or go after somebody and then they respond with force and then you shoot them. That doesn't work. So you have to we, you, to answer your question, Mark, you'd have to make a solid case that you were the victim, that you were reasonably in fear for your life or the li- or someone else's life, that you that there was no other option really for you, even though we don't have a duty to retreat. We don't, you know, because we have the castle doctor for our house and our car, we can still uh, still use the castle doctrine until some moron takes that away from us. Uh, hopefully not. But so, so you're the victim. You use you were reasonable in your in your actions. You ask the person to stop if 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 you can, if you have an opportunity to do that. I have a good friend who about a while back. Uh, he was he was stopped in his pickup truck and he could not move out of where he was stuck between other cars and things. And a guy came up with a crowbar, was beating on his window, broke his window, started beating my friend. And my friend had a pistol and he said, you know, please stop. And he hit the guy in the head even with the pistol set, you know, and the, the guy kept coming at him. Well, he was reasonably in fear for his life. And so he shot and killed the guy. He was arrested and taken to jail and had to make bail, bail and hire a lawyer and all. And a grand jury no billed him, which means his case was dismissed at the at the grand jury level. There was no probable cause because it was a clear self-defense. A lot of times in these situations, the police will see what happened and they will um, they will uh, not even file the charges. So that happens a lot. And we prefer that. Okay. Yeah. That uh that leads to a thing uh, again I, I I'm I'm bringing up different things you know like uh, 
uh, Masad Ayub talks about in his books, excellent firearm instructor. Yeah. Um, be sure you're the first to call the cops if at all possible. You don't want to like try and you know run and even wait 10, 15 minutes. You you know immediately call the cops because, uh, and here he mentions a lot of time whoever calls first is usually the one that gets believed, unless there's you know just obvious signs that there was you know, shenanigans going on. Any thoughts on that? Or well, I think that's probably usually true, especially in this situation. Although I do see a lot of cases where. Uh, frankly, especially with the virus, you know, people are at home and people are not used to being at home together and they get into arguments and somebody pushes somebody and, and somebody else pushes back and one of them calls the police. Who knows who the original pusher was or who the original assailant was, but the police will come. They usually arrest the guy, but frankly, in the last 15, 20 years, they'll arrest the, the woman as well or, or, or her rather, not both usually, but the first to call sometimes can be the first to be arrested. They mm -hmm. can be arrested if the police believe that they were the one that were was really the bad guy in the situation. So it's just important. Number one, don't talk to the police. My rule is avoid police contact if possible. It, uh, frankly, if there's a police car at 7-Eleven and I'm not committing any offense other than possibly speeding, which I want to do, but I want a Coke or something. I, and there's, but there's a police car at the 7-Eleven. I go to a different 7-Eleven. I mean, remember the police job is to is to is to detect crime and to arrest people. That's their job. Yeah. And frankly, they'd rather arrest some really nice person than chase some guy on meth with a knife that's mm -hmm. stabbing people. So they can arrest some really nice person and take them and spend the rest of their evening processing that person. They made a pretty good shift. So I no. avoid police contact. If you do have police contact, the other number one rule is you don't talk to them. Oof. I'm sorry, I can't talk to you. I'm sorry, I can't talk to you. I'm sorry, I can't talk to you. Right. Speaking the Deutsch. <laughs> okay, so Michelle asks, is disparity of force a real defense? You know, that, that's a really great question. It, it certainly can be. Again, if three people come to one uh, person, and, and I mean, for example, a, an elderly female with three young stud muffins attacking her and trying to do her bodily injury. And that's clear, but again, it's very subjective. So you have a right to use force. If you believe that your life is in danger. Yeah. Like you said, it's, it's not like sometimes in TV shows and stuff you hear, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt and things like that. But you use the phrase uh, a, a reasonable man would feel that way so right. like the average person okay mm -hmm. okay here's here's a really good question what is the typical cost for defense if, you know if you had to self-defense and you let's say you end up in court uh how much do you think the the person win or lose are they going to have to end up shelling out well, i'll tell you a secret about criminal defense law we, we we say we're like vending machines money in work out um, if, if we if we lose a case, we did a bad job. We don't deserve to be paid. If we win the case, you had a good case. You didn't really need us. So the rule is you have to pay up front. That's typically the case. Some if you have a public defender, of course, that's a whole different ball of wax. But typical cost, I would say, in Texas, especially in a well, in a suburban area like Houston, you're going to pay at least twenty thousand dollars as a, as a as a starter. As a starter. Yes, sir. Yeah. And it's something like a like a uh, a murder or capital murder that goes to trial is going to be a hundred, hundred fifty thousand. Oof. Okay, that's that's very important information right there. If nothing else, hopefully that that brings things home there. Okay, another question from Constance: uh, Does the Second Amendment allow me to defend myself or my family in imminent threat? And I will mention again that she is not located in Texas; she is located in another state. Um, but is there any state that says? Well, okay, there are a number of states, like you said, that you have the duty to retreat. Mm -hmm. So I guess, Constance, depending on what the rules of your state are, you probably need to look that up if you are required to write, you know, try and retreat. Um, but if you are trying, let's say you are cornered in your bedroom and the only way out is through, you know, the threatening force. I got to think even in states like New Jersey and Delaware, you know, at that point, 
you know, whatever you use to stop the threat would be legal. As a lawyer, how do you think that would play out? Two things. If it's a threat of, of death, if you're reasonably in fear for your life or someone else's life. And then secondly, I would say, again, it's not the Second Amendment that, that allows you to defend yourself. You have, a, you have a right as a human. You have a right to defend your property. So those are the rights constitutionally because, again, we're, we are not subjects. We are citizens. Um, yeah. And oh, in every yeah. state has different rules. And so it, and it's, they, they can be pretty wanky. Yeah. One thing people need to remember about the Constitution is it does not say the Constitution and the government are not the ones that give you the right. As a human, these rights are innate by the mere fact that you exist. It's just codified that the government cannot infringe upon those route, uh, rights. Okay, uh, here's a, another good question. Uh, your thoughts on castle doctrine in relation to the social unrest we've been seeing, whoops, sorry. Actually, David, we're gonna get back to that one. There was, okay, here it is, okay. Uh, we all know that traps are a bad idea because they can trigger indiscriminately, but are traps legally covered under the castle doctrine? My understanding and my instinct is no. There was a bunch of law about that 20, 30 years ago uh, because there were a bunch of cases about it. Traps are, I don't believe, are legal, period. A trap that is going to cause serious bodily injury death to an intruder, I don't believe they're permitted. Yeah, and my understanding is the same. The law is against that, especially because a trap, you know, it's kind of set for when you're not there. Mm -hmm. So the claim of, you know, and fear of bodily harm, you know. Uh, I know that became really big when the, the first Rambo movie came out. That seemed to cause a lot. Okay, uh, and now with uh, David's, uh, multiple people versus one person. That to me sounds like disparity of threat. Uh, if there's several people coming after you, the risk to you goes way up. That's right. And but again, if the if a reasonable uh, re, the reasonable band standard, a, a reasonable person standing in your shoes would have believed that you're in you're in serious danger of imminent bodily death or injury, a uh, bodily injury or death, then you're entitled to defend yourself by whatever means necessary. And certainly if they're presenting deadly force to you, you're absolutely entitled to use deadly force. One or more. That brings up a great question. Let's say they're chanting like kill the you know person or you know they're they're at least vocalizing that they want to do violence to you. So six they haven't yeah, begun to actually beat on you. <laughs> you know? Sometimes may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, right? That was a thing we learned as children. So yeah. You know, the, my theory of, of this day and age is everybody needs to get some skin and everybody needs to be nice. And we don't have so, problems, just the fa so just the fact that they uh -huh. are chanting they want to kill you is We're not enough. Okay. Absolutely. That makes sense. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. So there are several people, again, asking about the cost, the legal cost of defense. So we already heard it's like, you know, probably around $20,000 to start and can go up you know, into the hundreds of thousands. There are several people asking about the concealed uh, carry insurance. Um, there's like Texas Law Shield and sort of things. And again, my understanding is yes. In fact, that's pretty much how I found you. Uh, right. Like I'll, I'll just throw it up here. The Armed uh, Citizens Defense Network, after looking at all these, there's, there's a bunch of different types. Um, and they have different rules and regulations and what are they all? Some like just cover, you know, firearms, some cover any sort of defensive, some only cover while you're in Texas and all this stuff. After looking at all of these, I settled on the armed defense uh, network, armed citizens defense network is pretty much any form of self-defense anywhere in the country, though they do have some issues in the state of Washington, um, but they seemed, in my opinion, the best choice. And actually, uh, it's already, wow, we're, we're going really fast. Good questions and stuff. Uh, I just need to throw out a quick sponsor because there are people that keep the show going by giving me free stuff. So, of course, Uncommon Bees, uh, the honey. And if you use the Forking Weeds discount code, you get 25% off any orders there. And they have a ton of stuff. Check them out. 
And then for my bushcraft buddies, those that go out camping, hiking like they're cavemen and cave women, Campcraft Outdoors, maker of non-plastic outdoor gear. So check them out and use the Take 10 coupon and you get 10% discount. So, okay, now back to interesting stuff. Sorry, sponsors, but lawyer, free lawyer for an hour. <laughs> you know? Okay. Hey, um, me. <laughs> let's see uh oh wait 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 no so for a hundred thousand dollars defense wouldn't it be cheaper to just hide the body i know you're choking but we really don't want anyone to think <laughs> this because secrets get found out honestly uh, my mentor a hundred years ago taught me that you know murder is really the simplest crime to get away with because all the witnesses are dead Mm -hmm. uh, people usually will be found out and it is is the i mean there are as you know the unsolved murders and unsolved whatever crimes and that's been going on but those with dna it, it, people are, are getting found people are getting found um there are people who are afraid to do the dna genealogy stuff just because they're afraid that they'll somehow their dna will be used to track somebody in their family who committed a crime yada yada hiding the body Frankly, in the 40s was probably a great idea. And not so much anymore. No more. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Okay, here's a good question uh, involving dogs. Uh, so this person lives out in the middle of nowhere. I know this. Uh, illegals travel through my area all the time. I have acreage and livestock, including livestock guardian dogs. If my dog attacks a trespasser, am I liable? Well, <laughs> that's, I mean, that is a law school question, frankly. I'm, and I'm <laughs> trying to remember what they taught me. Um, typically, you're liable for the, the acts of your animals, which you own and presumably control. So you're going to be liable for their actions. If the person is illegal and on the property, honestly, I don't have to, I don't know the answer. And if you call me, I will find out because I don't honestly remember. And I apologize. Yes. And I will say Mary's, uh, Website is awesome. It has a live chat feature. Uh, and as you can see, she's very friendly and helpful. So just mention you heard her on the show and uh, yeah, ask her some questions. Be happy oh, to talk. Here's a, a good one for home car defense. Does having a CHL make you more liable as compared to someone with no training? I don't, I don't see why it would. And I don't really, I've, I've never really thought about that particular question. I don't see how it would because the CHL it, at least indicates you've had some training, you had to pass your test. So yeah. you know something about how the thing operates and what the dangers are. You, it, the CHL classes that I've taken are, are, you know, they're good. They teach you stuff and you know about safety. Then you know about not shooting unless it's required, you know, kind of the rules of engagement, so to speak. I would not think that they are, and that it is. I think that you're more well prepared than somebody who buys a gun off the street and and uh, goes and engages. Yeah, good point. Okay. Um, so I, I haven't seen it, but I know people are thinking, and I, I, I'm just going to take your your opinion on this. Uh, so now in the state of Texas, if you have a concealed handgun license. You are allowed to carry concealed. You are also allowed to open carry, which means you can have your pistol on display on your hip or whatever. Um, my personal feeling is never give the bad guys knowledge of, you know, who's armed and who isn't. But if you were, uh, you know, defending someone, do you think uh, it would help, hurt, or have no real impact? There are too many other factors would uh, come into play as far as, uh, if the person, if the defender was open carrying versus concealed carry. I'm a big fan of keeping your business private. And I have friends that I've convinced to get rid of their NRA stickers on their car because that's an advertisement for the for a gun robber to break into your car and steal your guns while you're in the grocery store or whatever. Same same thing. If you're carrying a weapon, you're you're almost inviting an engagement or you're inviting people to follow you and find out where you're going. The best mm -hmm. thing that I want to say though, I saw somebody had, had put a big sign in their yard with the arrow pointing to the neighbor's yard saying, those people believe in gun control. 
<laughs> so if you're gonna if you're gonna rob a house, <laughs> they're unarmed. So, yep. <laughs> that was great. And now, I, you know, advertising that you're carrying a weapon, and I, I have many friends that carry every moment of the day constantly, but they're concealed. Um, carrying open is just sort of a aggressive, an antagonistic sort of message in many the opinions of many. Yeah. Okay. Here's a good question from Tamara. What about a circumstance of being at a store with one's child and there is someone robbing customers at gunpoint? What rules apply here? Grocery store scenario for my case, then there was also the Luby scenario uh, from a number of years ago. So right. if you are, you know, at the scene of a of a place of business and someone is starting to threaten people with a gun. Again, I, the re, in my opinion, the reasonable man would say that that guy with a gun that's robbing people with a gun, he could shoot. He could start shooting any second. If I can take him out, boom, it's done. That and that's leads, defense of others. Okay. That's the defense of others. So that would even suggest that uh, you would be justified, in my opinion, really. So of shooting the bad guy in the back because you know if he was pointing a gun at yeah. someone else, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there is no turn and draw, fool. I mean, it's you do what you do to stop the threat. Right. And, and you know, the story, uh, it's been a couple of years now, but I remember the one of the first movie theater shootings. Mm. That guy passed, I think, three yep. um, theaters from his home that did not have the uh, 30 out 6 sign. Yeah. which precludes people supposedly from having from carrying firearms into the establishment. He went to a theater where people presumably would not be armed. Yep. yep. So he could just do a little massacre. Okay. Uh, going back to signs and so forth. Uh, another thing. And uh, I'm, 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 I finally had a chance to ask these questions I've always had. So hopefully the, the, the same questions the fans had. Um, at one point I was told you never want a, sign on any of your fences saying, you know, we don't call 911, we shoot, or, you know, ignore the dog, homeowner is armed, things like that. Because if you are displaying that sort of belligerence, it, the prosecuting attorney will use it against you and say, well, this person was waiting to kill a person. See, they had these signs and they had the Punisher logo on their gun and all this sort of thing. Um, so any thoughts on that? Is there things that a person... Uh, can do to, or that, you know, works against them as far as signage and all this sort of thing. I mean, I've even heard them say an American flag indicates, you know, you want to shoot foreigners and stuff like that. So yeah, I think there's a limit there. And again, I, I hate to keep harping on it, but it's a reasonable man standard. And frankly, in different communities, that reasonable man is going to be a different person. You know, in a rural community where everybody's armed and everybody has guns and everybody has cows or whatever, you know they have a they have a different attitude than suburbia. I mean, Austin has a different attitude than Houston, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, New Jersey has a different attitude than than uh, Texas, it, and so anything that you do to display your sort of willingness to engage or to be involved in gun gun shooting or gun uh, fire exchange, I think it doesn't look good. I think it's not good for you. I mean, you want to be the guy who's just straight and straight and, and I don't, but I don't, I don't go as far as saying the American flag, but some people <laughs> sure would, right? Yep. We, we were, I was raised to honor the flag. We, you know, we stand when the flag is, is um, presented. So yep. respect thing. Definitely. Okay. Um, here is, where was it? There it is. So Kathleen has asked, is fear of bodily harm from rape? A defense to shoot. That, that's serious. That's a, a serious bodily harm thing. And rape used to be a death penalty uh, situation in Texas. I don't know when that law changed, but um, rape is considered serious bodily harm, and certainly a rapist can can cause serious bodily harm. So yeah. yeah, yeah. So that would be a situation where the reasonable person would assume that the the person was justified. And again. <laughs> this is where you don't talk to the police. You know, you talk to your lawyer. If somebody, for example, starts or comes in and tries to rape someone, they don't know if that guy's there to rape them or to kill them or to ki kidnap them or what. Yeah. And those things can also be federal crimes as well. And so the, the, you have a right to defend yourself. Yep. 
Okay, Here, here's a question that's probably better for a instructor rather than a lawyer. Uh, but um, she's asking, isn't it the use of layers of defense best dog, wasp spray, and if they keep attacking, then a handgun? Um, I don't disagree with that. But again, the question is, are you in fear of serious bodily injury or death? And yeah, I, I would think rapid response, you know, it depends if you have time to go through yeah. those. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's a matter of if you, if they'll go away with, you know, with wall spray, then great. They went away and you jump in your car and drive away or you, you know, you do whatever you run away and you get into a safe place. All of that is better than shooting. Okay. Here's a, a, a good one. And I think this falls into loss of property. Uh, uh, what's the law when it comes to poachers on your property, whether they are taking wildlife or your livestock? I understand I need to be threatened to defend my life, but is there still old uh, uh, in place uh, in our laws in place in favor of landowners? And this is from Jason, I take it. And uh, you do have a right to defend property, including livestock. And, you know, if, uh, horse thieving is still a very serious felony in Texas. Uh, other places, maybe not so much. You do have a right to defend property. And if you want to talk to me more in depth about it, I can I can do some more research. But you do have a right to defend property, especially at night. So, uh, uh, again, non-deadly force would be better than deadly force uh, just because. Yeah. But, again, yeah, if someone's stealing your cattle, that's a huge financial loss. So. Right. Right. Okay, uh, this is an interesting question again from Constance. Do expired protection orders hold weight across state lines for the victim? So let's say someone you know had a restraining order against a person, it expired, and you know, the person crosses state lines to get at that person. That's a <laughs> that's a pretty serious situation there. With yeah, federal laws, it's very it's a very serious situation and. Every again, you're going to have to look at the state laws because the 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 state if it's an expired protective order and a, a protection order, there's a protective order and then there's a stay away order and then there's a a, mm. a temporary um, no contact order and there's a peaceful contact order. There's all kinds of contact orders, but if it's expired, it probably has no value except that if that expired. Um, order, for example, was in Texas and you're in Louisiana. I'm just, for example, I don't know anything about Louisiana law, but I don't practice there. It is possible that Louisiana would have a law that would give some credence to that even expired order, but I don't know. And again, it would be a state by state question. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Here's a really good one and something that I think is a concern of a lot of people. So I've had, if that, if the person is injured, you know, even though they came to steal and do harm, if they are injured, uh, they could turn it into a civil case and sue the homeowner, for example, who injured them. Is that the case? And Whoops, you know, we're <laughs> okay. Sorry. Oh, for the, a minute there, you were breaking up, but I think we have you uh, back now. Thank you. You know, the old law school issue is you can sue me for running over your poodle with my red Corvette. You don't have a poodle and I don't have a red Corvette. Anybody can sue anybody. So that's always true. One of the reasons that was glibly stated to me when I was first uh, getting a, a formal training by licensed trainers in firearms was that this is why you shoot to kill because somebody that you shoot in the hand or shoot in the leg, they're going to, if they survive, they're going to sue you. And you're going to have a problem and you're going to have to fight the lawsuit at, at the very least mm -hmm. and you have insurance you'll be covered and you won't suffer any damages but it's it's a problem if they're dead they're probably not going to sue you yeah of course then their family might yeah. on <laughs> but uh so and then that would suggest then that the twenty thousand dollars legal fee we were talking about earlier for what would be considered a you know a, a justified case is probably going to be not part of the, the, the civil suit is going to cost a whole nother arm leg and, and three lives to pay off. So probably more. And you have homeowners insurance and you may have your liability insurance with the NRA or with one of the gun, gun uh, protection right. companies. Right. But, yeah. Yeah. Okay. What else do we have here? Um, Carrie, uh, just reminding people again that, 
uh, Texas does not have open carry without also the person having the concealed handgun license. There were several people asking about that. Uh, boom, boom. More booby traps. Yeah, we already decided booby traps are bad. Um, let's see. Going back to what you said at the beginning for people who weren't here, uh, you've, you've been forced to defend yourself, and now, you know, you make you said you call 911 and ask for two ambulances can you go over that again or you know hover you know x plus one ambulances with x being the number of people that you had to stop because you felt threatened yeah you call you call the 911 tell them you need police there's been a crime there's been a you're a victim of a crime and you need two ambulance or or, or, you, or one plus however many perpetrators there are that are injured yeah and yeah. that's and then that's it, that you don't talk any further. Then when you're in the hospital or on the way to the hospital, you call your lawyer, you talk to your lawyer, you tell them what happened. Uh, you, if you have insurance, uh, one of the companies we talked about, that Mark talked about, you want to um, be sure you talk to those people as soon as possible. Yeah, that makes sense. So, okay. Yeah, so you don't even, you know, when you say don't talk to the police, that even includes 911, really, then, you know, because they're, yeah. they're the police. Yeah. Well, and they, they 911 operators are trained, as I understand it, they claim that they can detect whether or not the person is doing the calling as a perpetrator of the crime. They say that they can detect by the by the things that they will say, they can mm -hmm. by their by their tone, by their whatever. So I'm like, yes, okay, and people read, you know, tarot cards too. But I don't I don't you don't want to say anything more than is necessary. And some, I'm chattier than some people and other people are chattier than me. But when you're talking to the police or to law enforcement of any kind, whether it's EMTs or firemen or police or whatever, don't talk. Just don't zip it. Hmm. I guess so doctors and nurses then who I guess that well, even then you don't want to say anything about the crime. You just want to like describe the symptoms you're having that, you know, had you concerned, I guess, you know, un until the lawyer is in the room that can put their hand over their mouth and say, shut up. <laughs> yeah, we charge extra for people that talk. No, just kidding. Okay, here's a here's a question. Uh, I carry a revolver. I was told that practicing fast hammer pull was considered premeditation, that one should not train cocking the hammer, but just pull the trigger. So I guess a double action revolver, uh, use it as a double action revolver, not a single action. Again, because that shows you are itching to kill someone. I guess. If you're in a life or death situation where you have an imminent threat of a serious injury or death, I don't think it makes a hill of beans if you if you cock or don't cock prior to pulling the trigger. I mean, you get a better shot if you don't if you you know prepare your for your hammer right. But. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, okay, here's a question. Uh, actually, it, it's my question, not one of the guests. Uh, you're shooting, you miss the perpetrator, you put a bullet through a Apple store and destroy $10,000 worth of computers, but no one is hurt. You're liable for that, aren't you? <laughs> Even in the, you know, the, it's not so much a question, it's just uh, more of a reminding people. Yeah, Ooh. I think you could be liable for it, but not necessarily. If your action was reasonable, then that was sort of maybe the fallout from that. that that may be a defensible thing as well though okay here's actually a really good question from dennis what happens to your handgun when you're taken to the hospital well you give it, you're going to give it to the whoever picks you up yeah and i actually that happened to me uh back in 2016 i was in a real bad bicycle wreck when a lady opened her door in front of me as i came through oh. um and so I ended up, yeah, concussion, cracked ribs, it was messed, but I had a pistol on my at the head. Uh, somehow I was coherent enough. I had no idea what the day it was, who was president, anything like that. But I was able to tell the ambulance person that I did have a licensed handgun in my pocket. And my wife came and they gave it to her to take you know, away. So uh, at least in this particular ambulance crew, uh, they felt comfortable giving the handgun to, you know, well, my wife in this case, or someone they trusted. Um, I'm assuming, though, in the situation where a, you know, someone has been shot and they're laying on the ground, the ambulance crew probably 
you know, under maybe no, it's like evidence, I guess. That's exactly right. It will be taken as evidence. Okay. No. Actually, here's a question. Would the ooh, we're running out of time here. Okay. So would the ambulance uh take you away before the police could get there to see things? I mean, or is it a race between the ambulance and the police? You know, it just depends. It depends on how busy they are. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Um Here's a, uh, one last question from Mike. Is there any type of ammunition that carries penalties if used in a justified shooting? That's a great question. I don't know the answer, but I don't. If you buy ammunition from a licensed dealer, you're probably going to be okay. Uh, if you alter the ammunition, you may not be okay. And, and I'm not aware of any type of ammunition that carries a penalty. Yeah. If it's a justified uh, shooting, I don't think it makes a hell of a sense if you do black eyed peas or bullets. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and there was always, you know, a long time they talked about the cop killer bullets and the dum dum bullets and things like that. And mm, yeah, all... it's, yeah, if it stopped the threat. Okay, wow. Um, it is nine o'clock, and I'm getting a bunch of texts from people too. So at this point, though, people, uh, really, we got to let Mary go. Um, maybe we can get her back sometime in 2021 to, to try and do this again or talk about some other things. Um, but for now, just a huge thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for your time. Yep. Let me put your link and your information up there again for people. It was great fun, Mark. I, I really oh. appreciate you having me and I appreciate all the great questions. You, I'm really happy that people are interested in doing the right thing. It's very, yeah. very, it's wonderful to, for me. Thank and you. That's why I, I, I try and take care of the tribe. And so this is something that is very important so that people understand because I come from a long line of police and things like that. And, and my dad was an insurance agent. And so the things can spiral out of control really quickly. And so trying to be prepared for that. Boy Scout, right. be prepared. Okay. I am going to, again, try and shut it down. Uh, Mary, you and I will still be live, but everyone else will be gone. So, all right. Good night, everyone. See you tomorrow morning at the donut shop. <laughs> Good night.